want to welcome you to our virtual etiquette dinner. Thank you all for joining us this evening and welcome to my dining room. <laughs> um, so we are doing things a little bit differently than we would with an in-person um, event, uh, but we're so glad that all of you are able to join us virtually and we're still going to make this um, happen and hope that you pick up some important tips and skills that you can put into practice in your professional settings, whether that be a networking event or um, a dinner or an interview, whatever the case might be, um, we're going to learn together tonight um, in order to you know, improve that professional presence in your future career. Wonderful. All right, so we're going to go ahead and get started. I'll introduce myself. I am Nicole Feldhues. I'm the Director of Career Development here at Duquesne. And our kind of co-host um, who is running the show behind the scenes is um, Jen, well, Jen Lytle-Smith now, um, who will be, you know, making sure everything runs smoothly with our program here tonight. Just to frame what we're doing um, kind of here tonight um, is, you know, really Think about um, situations that you might encounter with networking or a dining situation in your professional life. So kind of those more formal, um, high stakes kinds of environments. So we know that dining is an important part of our life, an important part of our culture um, in many ways, whether it's a social event or a professional or a career event. Um, and we, you know, have casual environments where we're dining, right? Maybe while we're driving, maybe we have a, just a pizza box open and we're hanging out with friends. But for tonight, we're really talking about those more formal situations. So this might at Duquesne look like, you know, maybe it's an award ceremony or banquet, or um, it's something like our senior celebration, you know, when you graduate, um, which involves, you know, people from across the university and our seniors and their families, right? Um, so it could be that type of environment. It might be that you're attending a professional conference. Um, in the future, when you're working, it could be a holiday party at work or maybe an interview um, where a meal is involved. Um, it could be a networking reception at a local, um, you know, a local chamber of commerce or other things related to a career situation. So we're going to encounter these kinds of social situations throughout our career. And they really do make a difference in terms of our you know, ability to get hired. And then certainly our ability to be you know, kind of taken seriously and promoted um, you know, throughout our career. So you know, one of the very first things we want to do is kind of open that Webster's Dictionary, right? What is etiquette? What are we talking about here? Um, and so Webster's defines it as rules governing socially acceptable behavior. You know, this emphasis on rules, I think, can seem a little intimidating, right? It seems like something we have to, to memorize and there's going to be a test on it, right? Um, and that's really not what we're going for here. It's not how I want us to be really thinking about etiquette. And it certainly is about some rules, and it'll sound like we're talking about rules, but I want to go and dig a little bit deeper. So our next uh, slide kind of relates to etiquette reconsidered, right? So I really like this perspective by Calista Gold. She was a cult from the Culture and Manners Institute. And so things really stood out. So bear with me. We'll take a look at this together. Um, and she says, the biggest misconception about etiquette is that it's designed to make everyone conform and quash individualism, as if etiquette rules were constraints that restrict us from creativity and self-expression. It's quite the opposite. We are a collection of our experiences in life. Those experiences make us uniquely us. Etiquette is a greater awareness of the people around us and a kindness towards people of all different experiences. Etiquette is about being aware of and attentive to the people around us. And the rules of etiquette give us confidence so that we can let our personality shine through. So for me, this really hits to the heart of it, of what and why um, we're here this evening. Um, it really is about how we're aware of other people, that we're creating environments that make people feel comfortable and welcome and respected. Um, and it really, you know, understanding all of this and being able to navigate it with confidence really helps us, you know, shine through, right? So we don't have that barrier. Maybe if we're a little bit nervous, right, on that interview, um, or we find ourselves in that networking situation for the first time and feel really overwhelmed. Um, then it can be hard sometimes, right, to really communicate effectively with, you know, our skills and what we bring to the table. But if we feel confident, if we have these kinds of experiences, we learn some things, um, then we're going to really let our personality shine through. So it really lets the individualism come out. So I like how she reframed it. That's really what we're trying to achieve here tonight is to make you feel comfortable and confident. And if we accomplish that, um, then I think, you know, we've done our job. So we're going to 
kind of get into the actual meat of it. So understanding the table setting. So first we want to kind of take a look at what is here around us. And so um, we have a slide up there so you can kind of see a more formal table setting. I have a little bit of a model here at my table as well. So we want to know kind of where everything is. Now I can't remember Jen with the poll question, um, poll question two, um, in terms of the table setting, if we want to do that now, or you want me to go over the table setting first? Yeah, let's do it now. Okay, so great. it was a true or false question. Mm -hmm. The forks are placed to the right side of the place setting. 44 okay, per, mm -hmm, I'm so sorry. <laughs> no, I just I said, what did people say? <laughs> so 44% said true, 56% said false. Okay, so the 56% have it. So the majority of you did, in fact, um, know that the forks are not on the right, they are on the left. Uh, but let's talk about this place setting in terms of right and left. And I'll give you some tips and hints to help you really remember where everything is. So starting with that silverware, okay, and you can see in your diagram or on my table that they are to the left. One way that I remember where all of this is, is that on the left, the word left has four letters, L-E-F-T. The word fork has four letters, F-O-R-K, so fork on the left. On the right, right has five letters, and so does the word spoon, and so does the word knife, right? So I don't know if that, that was intentional in any way, um, but it just so happens that that's the case, and so it really makes it easy to remember kind of what's on what side of the place. So if you ever have to set this out um, yourself, or you get all your silverware wrapped up in a napkin when you're at a restaurant, you'll now know where to put that. Left, four letters, fork, right, five letters, our spoon and our knife um, are on the right. And then also for thinking about a left to right kind of orientation, the other hint I give is that etiquette is A-OK. -okay. So if we look at our own hands and looking at mine's not gonna help you very much because I think it's reflected in kind of a, a mirror effect. We are looking at our hands and my left hand, that A-OK -okay sign kind of looks like a B, right? So that's gonna stand for bread. So our bread plate, you can see, and that butter, right? Bread and butter. That's going to be on our left side. So that plate is, um, this one's mine, it's on the left. And if I look at my right AOK -okay sign, I have the word D and that's gonna stand for drink. So you're gonna have your water, any you know, wine glasses, your coffee cup. You don't see that in the diagram, but you can see that you know, over here. Um, if we have a coffee service, that's going to be um, on the right. So AOK, -okay. now don't do this when you're at a meal, like putting your hands up there, you can do it subtly, right? Under the table, if you just can't remember what belongs to you. So that's a little bit about the table setting. Now, a few more things I want to point out is that, you know, we have the bread that it may have. I don't have it on my plate, but in the picture, you can see that knife, right? There could be a bread knife. Um, above our place setting, we have more silverware, and that is our dessert silverware. Um, so that could be up there as well. Now, we're going to talk a little bit about silverware placement so we understand the place setting. A good rule of thumb is that you work your way from the outside in. That follows along with courses. So our outermost fork is going to be the salad fork. And most often you'll have two forks. That first fork might be a little bit smaller. It might have less tines, just kind of depends. And then you move your way in. So my next fork would be my dinner fork. Now you see a fish fork in this that's a little more formal, um, more courses uh, happening in that meal. And so there might be some additional silverware, but most common you're gonna have the two. And if I go to the right on my place setting, I have um, kind of that rounded oval, larger spoon. Sometimes it's, it's round, sometimes oval, and that is our soup spoon. Um, you will typically have two spoons, um, not in this particular um, environment, but oftentimes they'll have a, a, a teaspoon set down or a beverage spoon. That's what that's for. And then if we have more than one knife, again, it goes by courses. So we have the um, salad knife, if we have two and the dinner knife on my plate setting. There again, you see that fish course um, and that is in between the two knives. Uh, but again, if you just remember, no matter how many forks or knives and spoons might appear, we work away from the outside and then towards the plate. Basically each silverware is going away, right? As they clear courses and it just kind of comes in closer. So that's a good way to remember uh, what's in your place setting, where it goes and what to use when, okay? So that's a bit about the place setting. And where this can really come in handy, um, our, as our next slide really shows, is when there is a complicated table, right? So, um, or a crowded table, right? If you're at a conference or a banquet or a wedding, oftentimes you're trying to fit a lot of people at the table. Or if it's a very formal meal, there's just a lot going on. And you can see that. So if you remember that etiquette's A-OK, -okay, you're gonna be able to really navigate this place setting um, with ease and with confidence. 
Um, this one I think is probably one of the most complicated tables I've ever seen. That's why I grabbed the picture. Um, there's lots of stemware, like four forks, four knives, just stuff all over the place. So, um, but we're just gonna remember A-OK -okay and work your way from the outside in. Okay, so now we're gonna get into the meal itself. So a general rule of thumb that I like to you know, talk about is follow the host, be the host, right? So if there's a host at the event, you really can look to the host for some guidance as to what's gonna happen next or you know, maybe what might be appropriate to order in, in a particular instance. So you can follow the host's lead. So we'll talk a little bit about that throughout. But when there's not a host, if you are at that, that wedding and you're just randomly kind of put at a table, think about what a host um, would do, or if you're at a networking event, right? What does the host do? If you were having a party, you were hosting an event, you would be, you know, in charge, right? You wouldn't be sitting in the corner, you wouldn't be a wallflower, wouldn't be shy. You'd be making sure you interacted with people, had great conversation, you know, uh, took, took the lead, you know, made sure everything was happening. So sometimes we have to put on that host mentality um, and really, you know, make sure that we put into practice the things we learned tonight and are feeling, you know, comfortable really kind of taking that lead. So when we start the meal, arriving, um, you know, at the table is an important, you know, part of, um, part and part of the meal and how we arrive at the table. It looks like we have a poll kind of related to the beginning of the meal here, Jen. Do we have a poll question one? Um, we have, which handshake is the worst? Ah, yes, yes. So arriving at the table, we're going to talk about greetings um, and handshakes are certainly part of that greeting. Um, and so let me just chat for a bit and then we're going to get into the results of this poll. So when we arrive to the table, you know, we obviously want to, you know, say hello, introduce ourselves to the other people that we're dining with. We might, if it's appropriate, depending on where people are, you know, seated or if maybe you're arriving first in a lobby before going to your table, you would greet them with that handshake, right? Now, a days with COVID, right, it's a little bit different. Um, and so we might do something like nod the head, you know, make eye contact, smile at the person. That's a great way to engage them um, during this time. But normally when we're not kind of in a, in a pandemic kind of situation, it's important to, to know how to have a proper handshake. So let's do that poll question one. Okay, so 33% of people said the limp fish handshake is the worst. Okay. 11% uh, said the reluctant regal. 22% mm -hmm. said the never ending handshake. And 33% said the clammy Sammy. Nobody chose the bone crusher. Ah, okay, okay. So no one, no one doesn't like that over aggressive handshake, but really all of these are not good first impressions, right? So you wanna be uh, really you know, confident in your own handshake, practice that with other people, get feedback with it. Um, we wanna avoid all of these ones. So that clammy Sammy, if you have clammy hands or you're a little bit nervous, make sure you wash your hands right before an event, use hand sanitizer, that's easy to do these days, right? That really, I was, always gave that as a hint because it kind of dries out the hands a bit, right? So it helps offset that. Um, and just try not to really hold your hand. Like if you're nervous, holding your hands together is only going to make it worse. So try to, you know, keep them open, you know, as much as possible to the air. Another one that you didn't, you know, like was that limp fish and that always comes up. So we want to make sure that we have a good confident handshake, but we're avoiding the bone pressure, right? It has to be kind of somewhere in between. So it's firm, but it's not overly domineering. So again, pay attention to the handshake. It's a part of the universal greeting um, in kind of a professional setting. So uh, perfect that and it helps you make that first impression. So we're gonna to arrive to the table. When we're getting into a chair, we're gonna get into it from uh, right-hand side. So if someone holds out your chair, that's how you would enter and you would sit down. And then it really is the official start of the meal. And how do we signal when this meal actually begins? Well, we can follow the host lead if there is a host. Generally speaking, you want to kind of signal the beginning of the meal, you know, right prior to meal service, right? Um, so if we're just arriving, um, if we're waiting for people, we would wait for everyone at the, in the party or at the table to arrive. Um, and how we signal the official start is by placing the napkin on our back, right? So the first thing, just you know, word of caution, you don't get to the table, no one else has arrived, and put your napkin on your lap because that's kind of considered, you know, well, I'm here, I'm ready to eat, you know, I don't know where everyone else is. Um, so it's not, you know, really, you know, it's not really the beginning of the meal yet just because you're there. Right. So it is waiting for the whole party to arrive. And when it's close to the time of the meal. Now, I don't have a cloth napkin here, but we're going to open up that napkin. It's going to stay folded in half. 
And we're gonna put that on our lap, right? And we use the napkin throughout the meal to blow it gently in our mouth, wipe our hands. It's gonna stay in our lap throughout the meal. Now, one thing I do, especially if I'm dressed nice as it, is that interview, you've got that really nice suit on, or it's a more formal occasion and you're really dressed up um, in a suit or a nice uh, dress. I sometimes will fold the top of that, that napkin, if you can see what I did there, okay, kind of away from myself. And then you can use that kind of to wipe your hands and it stays away from your clothing a little bit. So that's just a little hint for me um, that I throw in there. It's not really kind of an etiquette thing, but if you fold that away, it keeps your things a little bit neater, but you still have that napkin on your lap, okay? So that's the official. Now, if we need to leave the table for any reason, the appropriate thing to do is if I'm in an individual chair like I am tonight, I can get up and leave the table. I could put it on my chair. If I'm in a shared seating, I'm going to put that to the left of my place setting, right? So right to the left of those forks. That would mean I'm coming back. When I'm finished with the meal, it goes to the right of the place setting. Now you don't have to refold it, but you know, don't just throw it on the table. Kind of just put it together gently and, and set it there. Otherwise, it's always in your lap throughout the meal. So that's a little bit about napkin use. Okay, so now the meal has begun. And some of the, let's go over some of the things that happen that you're gonna need to know, you know, as we move through the particular courses. So Jen, maybe if we can bring up, thank you. Wonderful. Um, beverages, certainly a part of the meal when they're serving beverages. So a couple things to keep in mind with beverages is you might like maybe lemon, if it's a nice tea um, or water, you might want sweetener in that iced tea. So we want to keep in mind everything in moderation is a good rule of thumb when it comes to etiquette. So if we're putting sweetener in our coffee or in our beverage, we're going to put one or two, right? We don't want to call attention that, you know, wow, that person really likes sugar. You know, they just put five packs of sugar in their, in their tea, right? Um, so we're going to keep that in moderation. But I always recommend, I don't have, I shouldn't have put a packet um, here for you to see, but I would tear it, what I call the three quarters tear. So tear, if it's in a packet, three quarters of the way, so you don't have a lot of different trash kind of going on, and then pour that gently, fold it up, and you can put it under your saucer if you have that, because the saucer and that cup of coffee is not going anywhere for the entire meal, so it's never moving, never being changed out, um, so if you chuck anything, you know, that's sort of paper or, you know, kind of uh, used trash, so to speak, if you put it under there, it just kind of keeps it, the table looking uh, neat. The other thing, um, with you know, beverages that I mentioned is coffee. Coffee is generally acceptable once the meal has begun. So with typically it's gonna come out with a dinner service, that particular course, or with a dessert course. But it's, even if it's dinner, it's appropriate to ask if they haven't brought that out, if you need to ask someone if you would like some coffee with dinner. But typically around dinner time, that's when it's served. Um, if there's soup, if there's salad, it's not usually coming out at that point. It's, it's gonna be starting um, a little bit later. Okay. All right. Passing items. So this is an important part of, uh, you know, the meal, because if we're at that wedding or at that conference, um, things might need passed, like the bread basket or you know, dressings for a salad. So we have another poll here on passing items. So John, do you want to handle that? Sure. Which way do you pass the rolls? 67% said to the right and 33% said to the left. All right, you guys are really smart. So 67% um, pass to the right is correct, but it is a little bit of a trick question. So I'll give a nod to those who said to the left. Um, so we do pass items to the right, but the most formal way of passing involves what's called an offer to the left. <laughs> um, so this is where it gets a little complicated. I'm using my bread plate instead. I don't have a bread bowl, um, but if, well, here, I'll use this. Um, so if it was a bread bowl, how this would look is I would offer to the person on my left. So if they were seated there, I'd say, would you like a roll? They would serve themselves. They would come to me. I would serve myself, and then I would pass it to the right. Okay. The general rule of thumb that we're looking for here is that you never serve yourself first. Okay. You never serve yourself first. So if that bread basket, this is where the be the host comes in. If it's closest to you and it is the salad, you know, of course, the meal is beginning or it's soup or salad um, and there's bread that needs to be shared, whoever's closest to it starts passing it. Okay. So take that lead. Don't wait for someone to ask, you know, you know, from coming to this event that it's time to pass the roll. 
but don't serve yourself first. If you're not comfortable with the offer or aren't sure what's going to happen with that or if they'll understand that and don't want to be that formal, then you would just pass it to the right and then eventually it would make its way back around to you and then you can serve yourself. Okay, but you can try the pass, it is, uh, the offer, because it is, you know, kind of a nice uh, way to do it. The idea is you're offering first to others. That attentiveness to the people that you're dining with, again, underscoring everything um, that we're doing. Okay, same with dressing. So if we had um, some shared dressing uh, and it was time for the salad course, you, again, if you're closest to it, would go ahead and start that passing around so that people can put dressing on their salad. Sometimes there'll be a server that comes around with dressing, right? And so it's kind of a hosted dressing. They'll come around and they'll offer the dressing to you. Um, and that's, you just, you know, be polite to the server, say thank you, that type of thing. If there are two dressings to pass, don't try to figure out who needs what, like who wants Italian, who wants ranch. You're simply going to pass both of them. Use what you need and pass it. People will use it, you know, as they need it and pass on the rest, okay? then eventually it'll come back around. That could be a little more tricky to do the offer, right? Do you want some salad dressing? It's a little messier. That might be best just passed around to the right. Okay. And if it is a family type meal where the food is actually plated and served, I know we used to have a holiday meal in my division, Student Life, and some of you might be familiar with uh, Father Hogan, although he's not been the vice president for Student Life for some years now, so you may or may not know him, but kind of an iconic figure on campus, and he always hosted a meal at the holidays for the division, and at that meal, it was all family style, right, so we did have plated food that we had to, you know, pass around the table, so it would follow those same rules, is that those items are, you know, offered to the left and then passed to the right. Okay, bread and butter, just a few things about that. Um, with our, our roll, the proper way to eat um, a roll is actually with our hands. Uh, you break off one piece at a time, butter that piece of bread and eat it. So don't cut the bread in half and butter both sides up. Um, certainly it seems like it's a little bit more of an informal way, but it actually is the correct way to eat roll and butter. If there is butter that goes along with the roll, um, that needs passed, you know, pass the bread first and then get the butter going right away. Um, that butter might be in individual packets. It might be a butter service. Um, maybe you've seen something like that where there might be different flavored butters. There might be um, chutneys or other kinds of spreads. Uh, make sure that is going. If, if it is a shared uh, butter service like that, you would take the butter from the shared, you know, plate, say it was here. You would take your portion of butter and put that on the side of your bread and butter plate. Never butter or put a spread directly, like take the time to actually butter. We're not supposed to cut it in half and butter it anyway, right? So the idea is you take just a part of it, put it on your plate, and then you would pass um, the rest of that. Okay, so it's a little bit about bread and butter. The only exception I would say to like the breaking it in little pieces with your hands might be if it's a particularly messy bread, you know, maybe it's a really like a garlic bread if that makes sense or it's saturated and melted butter already or kind of that breadstick um, you might have to break that breadstick into smaller pieces but you might have to um, kind of eat that or a sticky um, sticky roll something that's sweet in nature then you might have to actually use that knife and fork to cut some pieces because it's just too messy you know to break off with your hand so you know it's a judgment call um, but your basic bread um, hard roll and butter you would use your hand all right, moving on to silverware, right? So this is all the important stuff you need to know prior to actually eating um, a meal. So using that silverware, well, now we know where it is, right, on the place setting. Now we have to know how to hold our silverware and how to use it. So in just a basic, I'm gonna set this aside, basic uh, holding the silverware, how we do this is we have the, the fork to start in our non-dominant hand. So in this case, my left hand, because I am right-handed, and we have the knife in our right, right hand, or dominant hand in this case. So you would hold that silverware by tucking the handles under your palms, okay? Just like that. And we kind of have that relaxed posture, keep the shoulders down, okay? And we spear the food and we cut one or two bites of food at a time, only one or two, okay? What we want to avoid is seeing the handle. So, you know, we don't want to look like we're kind of spearing our food. You have seen people eat like this, even if they're holding this correctly. Um, you know, if I can see that handle, you know, like, so this fist kind of approach where this handle is up, like this is incorrect, okay? So again, it's tucked under the palms, just like that, okay? Now, when we are eating, there's two different styles of using the silverware, American style 
or continental or European style. Both are acceptable um, here. So what we do is they both start the same, it looks exactly the same, holding it just like this, sparing the food, cutting one or two bites of food. In the American style, there's a lot of switching that goes on. So we set the knife down on the plate, blade facing up. The fork switches to the dominant hand time now up. Take a bite of that food. Maybe you know, there was two bites. And we switch it back over, pick up the knife again, cut that bite or two, we set it down, we switch it over, we take a bite or two, right? So it's a little longer process, right? To eat, maybe it's a little more leisurely, definitely a lot more going on <laughs> than the next style that I'm gonna talk about. But that's the American style, it's probably mostly how, um, you know, those are, we've been kind of trained to eat, right? Okay. It's important not to cut up that entire, so say we had a chicken breast, um, as part of the meal, we don't cut that entire piece of meat up again, that one or two bites. Make sure you're cutting them small, right? A small bite of food. So that if we're having, again, if we're talking professional or career, it's important that we're building connections and that we're having good conversation or maybe learning about a company um, that we're interested in or conducting business. And so one or two, you know, bites at a time and small bites. So that, you know, if someone asks us a question, it's not going to take us five minutes to chew that food before we can answer, right? Because then that makes it feel a little awkward. So that's a good tip when you're really trying to have a conversation with somebody, make a good first impression. The smaller the bite of food, the better, even if it means you're taking you know, more bites, essentially, um, so that you can carry on a good conversation. So continental, how it looks a little different, starts the same. You're going to take that bite of food, but there's really no switching or laying down of silverware. So we they spear the food. Times down and it comes to the mouth, times down and we take that bite. So we cut a piece and take a bite, cut a piece. So you can see it's a little efficient actually, happens you know, a lot more swiftly. We're not having to switch things around, okay? So I do have a few slides here that um, I think will reinforce those things that I just showed you that we can kind of move through. So that's that proper and improper way of holding the silverware that I was showing you. So we have those handles tucked under our hands. Okay, and then next we have that American style and continental. The chief difference there is you can see the dominant hand times up for eating, and the continental is times down with the non dominant hand. And then there is a difference I want to go over here in terms of resting. So, that resting position in American style is that fork across the plate, and the fork, I mean, the knife across the plate, same as when we we're kind of pausing or switching, and then the, the fork times up, find a space on the plate off to the right hand side typically, okay, or left if that's what you're using um, as your dominant hand, okay, that's the rest for American. For continental, and it's really just set up so that it looks like you could come back and just start eating again, right, take that bite of food. In the continental style, that rest is going to look something like these kind of they don't have to cross literally because if there's food in the middle of your plate, but it can kind of be set down. And it really is just like if I'm eating and then I'm resting. So they just literally get set down on the plate exactly how, how we were using them. Times down on that fork, and you can't see that very well in the diagram, but on my plate here, it's times down. That's rest. Now, what if you're totally finished with the meal? Right at the very end, we have finished positions for the silverware. And that finished is going to look something like uh, the graphics. I'm going to put it on my plate here as well. The knife and the fork come together. The times are down. And the knife and fork look something like this. So it's going to, um, and Jen, maybe we can advance to the next slide. I think I do have graphics of it that might show it. There we go. So you can see that a little bit better than probably what you can see on my plate, but that comes together. In the American style, it is typically, um, that's sort of a 10 to four that you can see there. Sometimes in different etiquette, they also say it's okay to be like a nine to three. I don't know if you can see that on my plate here, but a nine to three is just kind of straight across. The important thing is that they're together, the times are down, and that the handles are off to the right. That's gonna be important in that American style. Um, and the continental finish, the times are up because that's opposite of how they eat. They eat times down in continental. So it's times up when you're finished. They're still together, but you most often see them in this 12-6 kind of position. But you could also probably put them just fine um, together in that you know, uh, 10 to four as well. Um, why is it important that those, those handles are off to the right or at least in the middle of the plate? It has to do with the server. Um, and how they're clearing the courses, right? Because you put it together when you're finished. Number one, it kind of signals to the server, right? This looks like I'm done, you know? They're neatly put together, they're placed just right. 
Um, and they're going to know that that means that you're finished. So instead of being questionable, they might still ask you, you know, are you finished with that? But it's going to give them an idea. But the reason we do this is because when you are served food, if it's an open table that they can move around easily, um, such as a table round, you know, at an event, they're going to serve your food from the from your left. So if I'm sitting here and they're bringing courses, if the server, if there was a server here, they're going to be setting my food down like this, okay? And when they clear courses, servers that are clearing courses clear from the right, okay, from my right. And so with this silverware together, if someone's clearing, you can imagine we don't have someone here right now, but they can more easily secure that silverware with their hand and, you know, and clear uh, that because it's together. And in fact, if it's not together, you'll often see a server take the knife or fork and they, you know, will put them together so that they can grab them easily. And that way it doesn't fall on your lap, it doesn't fall on the floor, it just really makes you know, the service easier. So that's where that comes from and why we have those finished positions. And the silverware, once you use it, should stay on the plate. We never put used um, silverware, dirty silverware back on a tablecloth. This isn't, you know, a fancy tablecloth by any means, but if it was and I was dining in someone's home at a holiday event or something like that, we just wouldn't want to put, you know, that's kind of where that comes from. You don't want to stain or put something back on someone's tablecloth. So it always finds a place, always, always when you're eating. That's why there's rest positions and why there's a finished position. And it also, you know, they're going to clear that. And then we're down to the next clean silverware that we'll use in that meal. Okay. So I hope that tells you a little bit about silverware. And I know that we've covered a lot of basics here so far. So I wanted to pause for just a moment to see if we've had any questions so far about, you know, the start of the meal, beginning the meal, um, the table setting, the silverware. We've gone over a lot of content in a quick period of time. Does anyone have a question at the moment? All right, so assuming someone is eating something like rice, yes. how do you eat it uh, using the continental style? Difficult. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Very carefully. So. Good, good question. And I should have mentioned this, so I'm glad um, it was Francesca, I believe, who's asking this question. Um, everything does eat is eaten from the back uh, times of the fork, uh, which takes a lot of practice. So you use the knife, um, that, say that's that rice or, um, you know, mashed potatoes or, you know, whatever the case might be. And you take that and you move it with the fork to the back, of, I mean, with the knife, I'm sorry, to the back of the fork and it goes to the mouth times down. That takes a lot of practice, right? Sometimes people cheat a little bit on that, maybe use continental, and then I, you know, they might still be scooping it up a little bit. Um, but you don't use, and I didn't mention this before either, when I told you this was a teaspoon, right, or a beverage spoon, there is no such thing as a dinner spoon or a food spoon. It's only for beverages, right? Um, or soup, um, or ice cream, or parfaits, puddings, that type of thing. And so all food is eaten with a fork. So in continental, on the back, an American, you know, scooping it up. And I'm sure people here that on this call, I know I've done it, I've eaten mashed potatoes with a spoon, I've eaten, you know, corn with a spoon, um, but the proper way to do that is to eat it with a fork, actually. Okay, we do have a question from Lauren, mm -hmm. a similar question, how to eat pasta then? Uh, yes, very good question. Does your meal tonight, I am, I'm in my home, so I don't know, I think Jen picked up a meal. Does it still have the noodles? Yes, it does, okay. and Wonderful. chicken. Okay, okay, so it's the same meal we had. We had an in-person etiquette dinner last night. Um, and so I did have that meal. In fact, I had some of it for lunch today, so I know exactly what you're, what you're having and eating. So very good question um, for that as well. So sometimes if you're like last night when we were dining, it was served with like a pasta spoon um, and you would use that dinner fork. And so if you have those noodles, you can secure just, um, just one or two. Like if you can use the tines of your fork, I don't have pasta here on my plate, but you would kind of separate out. What you don't want to do is you have that big pile of pasta, just stick your fork down, you know, right in the middle and scoop up a lot, right? So we're going to secure just a few times few strands and put it in the bowl of the spoon and we would twirl, right? So we twirl and we twirl until like you can't really twirl anymore. If you need to use the side of that fork to kind of uh, cut off the remaining end, if that makes sense. Uh, so it doesn't, you know, it's always going to be a little bit messy, uh, but then you can take that to it. Why it's important to just get a few strands is again, otherwise you're twirling, you're going to end up with a whole lot of pasta. If you don't like using the spoon or they don't serve a pasta spoon, that's fine. 
Again, you can do that same thing on your plate. Just separate out some of the noodles, try to catch just a few of them and twirl it on the plate. Okay, something like this. And again, we're gonna use the side of that fork to cut it off and then bring that food to the mouth. So hope that helped. If you're trying to make a good impression or you're in a high nervous kind of situation, don't order uh, long pasta, <laughs> right? It's just, it's gonna be challenging to eat. You're probably gonna feel a little bit uncomfortable, but you know, certainly now you know how to handle it. it you know, it's going to be fine. Um, but you know, that is something to think about when we talk about ordering later. And Francesca, I think you had another question. Yes, I was wondering if it's uh, if it's possible to mix the two styles. Like, if you don't remember <laughs> the whole part of one, can you mix yeah. it with the? Yeah, it, yeah. I think no one's probably going to notice it. You know, I think if you keep the general uh, things in mind of holding, you know, the silverware properly, you know what I'm saying, and you're taking those small bites. Like, those are the things they're going to notice. They're probably not going to notice that you're switching between styles, right? Unless they've been to this workshop. <laughs> Um, those people maybe don't have that, you know, so much committed to memory, right? So yeah, I think you'd be okay with that. Absolutely. One thing to keep in mind though that I didn't mention on holding this over, I kind of talked about the hands, you know, being down. Uh, what we, what you, what I, what you want to avoid is to look like you're. I always call this like protect. You're protecting your food, <laughs> um, and that would be when people kind of hunch over their food, right? You know, it's sort of like everybody else keep away. I'm going to eat this now, right? And if you look around a restaurant or whatever, you will see so many people who do that, right? Who really lean in, lean over, kind of get their face close to their plate. Um, and that's something you want to avoid. You want to keep good posture. You want to be able to make eye contact with people around the table and have conversation. And just you know, simply cut that food. Um, again, you may have to lean slightly in, but keep kind of a straighter back. Just avoid kind of the hunch or lifting up, you know, the elbows, right? Like we're like a bird or something, right? And we're kind of eating our food. So try to try to really keep the elbows down, the shoulders down. I feel like I'm teaching a dance lesson, right? Keep that all down and relax, and we cut that piece of food. Okay. Nicole, I have a quick question. Sure. So if the dressing is served in a ramekin. Yes. And not served with a spoon or there's no like spout or anything, can we use the soup spoon to take out some of the dressing? Yeah, that's tricky. Because you're, you're going to have to have held on to that soup spoon. And the soup course would come when we talk about courses in a moment. The soup course is going to come before the salad course. So my guess is that you're going to have that that spoon will have disappeared. Um, so in that case, I would probably, if they didn't serve that, that's a perfect time to ask your server for some help, right? So ask your server, you know, politely, um, you know, when you have a moment, can you please bring me a spoon for the dressing? You know, maybe they forgot to set something out or should have, just didn't think about it. Um, and it's not easy to pour. You know, if it had a little spout, it might be something you could pour. Um, and so I would probably ask my server in that case. Um, even if you use that beverage spoon, or then, then you don't have a beverage spoon to stir your coffee, right? So at some point, if you use that, you're still gonna have to ask your server for another spoon. So I, I would go either direction. If you can't get a server right then, use something you have, but then, you know, you're gonna need to ask your server, you know, for an additional spoon when you need it. So usually it's kind of comes with a spoon and it's shared, but the way the approach they're taking now because of, you know, everything, not wanting to share as much things as possible, um, they would gave individual dressings to everyone, but then that made it challenging because there wasn't the spoon, right? And it wasn't, it wasn't spout. But you never know what you're going to encounter. <laughs> when in doubt, ask your server, you know, for something that you might need. Yeah, very good. Thanks. Thanks for all those questions. Great. Um, and so let's talk about the, the meal itself. Um, I love this little graphic. <laughs> so, so perfect, you know, uh, giving some of those table manners um, that are so important that we'll cover in a moment. But let's talk about the actual courses. So there is generally it follows this order. This is a four, like a four course meal. Again, there can be more courses. You saw that fish fork, there might be a sorbet that comes in between. Um, there might be a little, um, I, I'm not good at pronouncing French whatsoever, but it's sometimes it's spelled like A-M-U-S-E, like amuse, amuse bouche, B-O-U-C-H-E, sort of like a little bit of a starter, right? 
Um, and so there could be, you know, lots of courses involved, but generally speaking, three to four courses is most typical. And that would start with the soup course first. So let's talk a little bit about that. And it looks like we have a poll related to soup. So let's start there. Yes. So the appropriate way to cool down hot soup is 0% said blow on it. 11% said stir it gently. Nobody said to add ice to it. Nobody said wait patiently. And 89% said both B and D. So stir it gently and wait patiently. All right, wonderful, wonderful. Um, I think you uh, all really knew <laughs> what you were talking about here um, in terms of how to cool down that soup. And that is one of the things that makes a soup course really challenging, right? Um, lots of things make soup challenging, in fact, right? It's hot, so that's what we were talking about in the poll. It has chunks of food in it sometimes, right? It's messy, maybe there's noodles. It's just a really challenging food to eat, right? So let's pretend that this is, you know, we'll bring this over here, like a soup bowl. Um, some tips for eating soup, and we'll kind of address that, is first of all, this is your soup skin. Um, and so again, it's gonna be usually larger, maybe rounder. It might already be in the place setting or if it's a soup that comes served on like a charger, like a, a saucer type um, bowl, it may have the spoon like on, on the plate, um, on the saucer, okay? So either way, that's your soup spoon. So we're gonna stir it gently, let that heat evaporate. We're gonna wait patiently. And if we eat it properly, it's gonna really help us with that hot, um, nature of the soup. So we scoop away from the soup, just across the top of the surface and away from ourselves. And then we can come back up, it pauses, pause a little bit, right? So in case there's any drips, you're not gonna end up with them on your shirt. And then you sip it out of the side of the spoon. Really watch slurping your soup, okay? Not making too much noise with it, trying to be quiet <laughs> as possible, but away just on the surface and that way it won't be too hot for you. And if you sense that it's too hot, it's okay. We're not gonna blow on it, we're not adding that ice to it, okay? The other thing we want to be careful of is even if it's the best soup in the world that we've ever had, really watch that you're like scraping the very grating, annoying sound that you can hear, <laughs> right? So don't really scrape at the bottom of the bowl. Um, we also don't use uh, bread, bread to wipe up the rest of the bowl again, no matter how good that soup is. Um, nor in a formal setting do we tilt the bowl, you know, to get the very last bit. Okay, you're gonna have to just leave it alone. <laughs> Um, eat what you can, um, you know, as best as you can, and, and that'll be it for the soup. Um, crackers or bread, in addition to not uh, using the bread to dip in the soup, crackers, unless they're a soup cracker, like little round soup crackers, they don't get uh, dunked in the soup or crushed up and kind of sprinkled in the soup. The only thing that, that, that come with the soup, in other words, the soup crackers, if there were maybe like tortilla strips as an accent or croutons as an accent or French onion bread that already has bread and cheese on it, right? Those things are built into the soup, that's fine, but you don't add the cracker. You can eat the cracker, you can eat the bread separately from the soup, but just don't put them together yourself, okay? I think those were the things about soup. What I generally recommend on soup, and I think if you go to a more formal dinner, they often do serve like cream soups or bisque soup. And the reason those are easier to eat, right? They're thicker, so they're not as likely to spill around. They don't have, they're usually more pureed, so they don't have as many chunks of things in them that make it difficult to eat or noodles or things like that. So when you're ordering again, if, if soup is you know something that you get to choose, you know, choose something that's a little easier to eat, like a cream, creamy type soup. Okay. Great. Now the next course is going to be the salad course. So a few things to point out about the salad course is um, you can cut, you know, that's why we have a knife, a salad knife and a salad fork. Um, again, don't cut up the entire salad. You want to make sure it's bite sized so we can cut it, but don't chop up the whole salad. That's called a chopped salad and they should do that in the back kitchen for you, right? If it's served that way. I like chopped salads, right? Because it makes it easier to eat. It's already all cut up um, for you. But otherwise, you're just cutting that bite or two at a time and not chopping up the whole salad. Um, if you do have that shared dressing, we talked about passing already, but remember that you're dining with other people, right? So if it's a shared dressing, you know, you're not the only one that needs that dressing. Make sure you're leaving some for others. Just being considerate. Don't, you know, be piling on the dressing. Again, everything in moderation is appropriate. Keep in mind that everyone else is at the table. Just like you wouldn't, you know, grab the bread bowl and take three pieces of bread, right? You take your one piece and you're sharing it with the table, okay? 
same with the dressing to keep in mind with that. And also salads sometimes present a challenge because they tend to have, you know, different things on them. Even a simple salad, uh, like you might've gotten tonight, it's gonna have carrot strips or maybe some tomatoes or a little cucumber, right? It makes it more than just throwing lettuce on a plate, right? So most restaurants, most banquets are gonna have, you know, kind of a little bit of nicer salad. There's gonna be things on it. And you might not like some of those things. So it's a good time for us to think about, well, what if you don't like something? <laughs> um, Really, the, the couple things I like to, to give for advice here is number one, never say anything that you don't like something, right? So a negative commentary about food that's presented to you is not a good look. <laughs> um, it really just shows a lack of thankfulness and appreciation and, you know, just a sort of a negative, you know, has a negative tone to it. So don't comment on it. The only exception to that would be to work with your server if you truly are maybe allergic to something or have a specific dietary need and, and that is not being met by this salad. You need to ask for something different. You know, absolutely, right? You need to be able to talk about that if it's, you know, yeah, a dietary need, an allergy, something like that. But otherwise, if it's just like, you know, I don't really like tomatoes so much, um, just, you know, work around the tomatoes. Kind of set them aside in the bowl, you know, eat the other things, just don't call attention to it. What you absolutely don't want to do, and we talked about this last night at the actual dinner, and I asked Nora, one of the head, um, you know, uh, catering staff who worked with us on our in-person etiquette dinners, you know, do you often see this? And she said, absolutely, where this bread plate becomes like a garbage plate. Simple. So they move food, you know, I don't like this, so let me put it over on my bread plate. Don't do that. <laughs> um, that's not what that is for. It is a bread plate. Remember the B, right? Bread and butter. That's all that should be on here. So don't move your food. Just, you know, work around what you don't like. Don't call attention to it. Because then this really becomes either a meal for someone else or, you know, it looks like a plate of everything. You know, someone's going to easily look at that and say, well, they didn't, you know, they're kind of picky. They didn't like anything um, that they were served. So um, we don't want to give that impression. Okay. And then entree or main course would be coming next. So again, as we would be moving and putting this, if we were in that real dinner situation, then this silverware would be going away and we'd be left with these last, right? Remembering that this fork tends to be a little bigger, maybe a little longer times than we have this um, uh, night. If we ordered something like a steak or something a little bit more, you know, difficult, they, they should bring that steak knife with that particular entree. And of course, then you can use it um, to cut that meat. So again, remember the silverware usage and all of that. In that place setting, I don't have it here, but salt and pepper. So a couple things to keep in mind with that, you know, main course, that's where sometimes seasoning something comes in. So I like to mention that here um, with the salt and pepper, just, you know, or, or maybe it's the creamer, you know, for the coffees coming around with the main course too. If you need something past and you're not close enough to get it, simply ask the person closest to it, you know, please, when you have a moment, can you pass, you know, the salt and pepper? Same thing for you. If someone might reach out to you and ask you to pass it. If they ask for the salt, um, which oftentimes people are like, oh, I just want the salt. Um, make sure you always pass the salt and pepper together. They are a kind of a set, right? And you want them to stay together on the table. That just makes it easier for the next person, right? Who wants salt and pepper, not to have to track it down, you know, from two different people across the, you know, the table in order to get that item. So the salt and pepper really should always stay a set and just go ahead and pass those together. The cream and sugar, kind of the same thing. Someone's like, oh, can I please have some cream? You know, it could be a good idea to pass that cream and sugar together. There might be some other people that would, you know, want that as well as you're starting to get that passed around when the coffee comes around. And I think next on the list, um, I don't have it up here in front of me, but I think is some things about just general, um, general situations, general table manners that kind of apply to a lot of different things. So in addition to um, the seasoning, I think we talked a little bit already about, you know, posture and, you know, you've heard sit up straight and don't put your elbows on the table. Um, and so in that case, I'd say hands in your lap or it's okay to have like your wrists, you know, maybe you're talking or something, you have those uh, kind of uh, wrist or forearm on the table, just not the elbows. Now, technically between courses, if there's no food being served and you're at like a three hour, seven course meal, I don't know if you'll ever experience that. If you read etiquette books, technically elbows can be on the table between courses. But I think it's just easier to remember, you know, no elbows on the table. Let's just keep it, you know, to the wrist sort of block. Okay. All right. Great. Um, and some other table manners to keep in mind. Um, we can have some sticky situations kind of happen, right? Some tricky kind of things. So a couple of those I like to mention is, um, you know, what if we start coughing? right, or sneezing. So if we're coughing, again, we've all learned this this year, we cough into our elbow. And if you can cough away from the table, not towards your table, you know, so kind of turn, you know, you're not going to 
it happens quickly. You're not gonna be able to get it completely around. So cough a little bit into the elbow. It, it becomes an uncontrollable cough. Maybe, you know, we were chewing something and it kind of went down the wrong pipe or we were drinking something that happens to all of us. If you cannot control that cough, that's a great time to ask to leave, um, leave the uh, table, you know, go to the restroom. Same with if you had to sneeze or something, try to, you know, sneeze away from the table. It's difficult if you have a cloth napkin, right? You can't really use that. Um, uh, so hopefully, you know, you're prepared with having some tissues or something handy that you can grab. But again, that might be where you have to excuse yourself from the table. Never blow your nose at the table. Um, that's just not becoming whatsoever, right? So um, the coughing and the sneezing at the table, just make sure you take a chance to leave. Um, no grooming at the table, right? So no lipstick, no, you know, makeup, no brushing the hair, you know, no, all of that, you would go to a restroom. Um, to use. And you might think like, well, that seems pretty obvious, Nicole, but honestly, I know I've seen people do that. So, um, you know, just any of that kind of grooming, take care of that um, by excusing yourself. Um, another thing that can be tricky is that we might get food in our teeth. So there might be uh, spinach in something. That's a tricky one or broccoli, or maybe we're eating that chicken or steak, but something just gets stuck, you know, in our teeth. If you can gently remove it with your tongue, you know, if you can kind of roll that around, that's great. Um, never use like the tines of a fork or a toothpick or a fingernail or anything like that at the table. Again, that's where we're going. You know, again, we're excusing ourselves um, to try to take care of that with a mirror. Um, if, you know, you sense that and just can't take care of it, that's what you do. If you cut a piece of food and there's gristle, right, or something you can't possibly chew and swallow, if you can, go ahead and chew and swallow it. Um, if you can't, um, the rule of thumb here is that it goes out of your mouth, how it went in. So, you know, a good example of this would be if you're eating an olive with a pit and, you know, you eat an olive with your fingers, if there's a pit, you can actually remove the pit with your fingers, okay? Because it went in with your fingers, it comes out with your fingers. But a piece of gristle or meat, right? That went in on a fork. So that has to come back out on the fork. This is tricky to do, uh, but there's really not a good solution no matter how you look at it. It can't go in the cloth napkin because that's staying on your lap throughout and other things that chewed up food um, that might fall on the floor. Um, and, you know, can't just spit it on your plate, right? So we're going to do that with the fork. Um, so maybe when that other person's sort of looking away, looking at their food, put the fork in our mouth, move the food to the fork and put it back on the plate, kind of cover it up. So that's sort of a tricky situation. Um, some other, you know, kind of table, um, table manner type things involve, you know, the to-go bag, right? So if we're in a banquet, if we're in an interview, we don't ask for anything to be packed up to go. If we're just dining out with colleagues, you know, we're at a work event, we're at a local restaurant or something, totally appropriate, you know, if you can get the food somewhere afterwards, you know, um, to refrigerate it or whatever, it's fine um, to ask for that in that type of less formal situation. Um, trying to think of some other basic table manners I cover. Um, oh, uh, chewing with your mouth closed, right? Make sure you're not noisy when you chew or smacking the lips um, together. Uh, that's where the small bites don't chew with too much food and certainly don't talk with your mouth full of food. So again, the small bites, if someone asks you a question, you can kind of, you know, chew really quickly, swallow that and be able to answer. You don't want to be chewing with, uh, or hand talking with, you know, lots of food. Okay. Um, oh, yeah. Uh, no smoking at the, you know, in, in table and I pretty much know where it lets you do that anyway. So it's just a good thing not to do. Um, with alcohol, just a couple of tips here on an interview situation or anything where you're being evaluated, you know, um, for a job, there should be no alcohol. Someone else orders alcohol that's interviewing you or whatever, that's fine. Say no, thank you and order something else. In a professional setting though, you might encounter alcohol, right? Our senior own senior celebration on campus um, with families and seniors, you know, would have um, limited selection of wine and beer available. Um, other professional networking events or conferences you go to, there might be those occasions. Um, networking things, you know, definitely have that. You know, if you get, I always say moderation, right? So that one or two drinks, that's your limit, um, or know what your limit is. Um, you just want to remember it's a professional setting. You're not out, you know, as close as you might know your colleagues. You're not out at a party with them, you know, in a, in, in a casual way. Um, so if you get like a drink ticket, a free ticket, I always say that's a great guideline, right? They gave you one free drink ticket. Use that um, and, you know, leave it be. 
And always, always know that it is appropriate in any setting not to drink alcohol. It doesn't matter if every single other person in the room has alcohol, you can choose not to. People have all kinds of reasons. Some people don't drink. It could be for religious reasons, for medical reasons, personal preference, anything. Don't need to explain yourself. That's your choice. Um, and feel totally comfortable. If you want to have a drink, you know, get that soda water or ginger ale or something like that. If you want to have a drink, feel like you're socializing, you know, um, and have, have something um, like other people do, but please never feel that way. And in a professional setting, you know, it's, it's better, you know, to make that choice or really limit um, yourself. Um, it is also good to be comfortable, right? Though, if you know that there's going to be a lot of situations and you want to, you know, have that glass of wine or you feel you might be ordering a glass of wine, brush up on that, go online. There's lots of good resources, you know, it might be something to learn about and be a little more comfortable with if you're not um, already. So those are some basic um, table manners. Oh, the one that is on this uh, slide that I put up, the little graphic that I would like to mention is please and thank you, right? So that relates to that server and right? Always say please, always be thankful and gracious, and that just shows good manners. Um, I often call those the magic words, right? <laughs> um, because they go a long way in life and really are probably the basis of all etiquette, right? So it's, it's being gracious, the please, and it's showing gratitude with the thank you. Um, and those two things, I think, surpass all rules um, of etiquette that we're talking about tonight. And so, you know, and use that server. That server can make recommendations. They can help you through the meal. If you have questions about how something's prepared, um, that's what they're there for. Um, and we want to give them that recognition. And conversation. I know I've been doing a lot of talking here, but normally if you're having a meal, you're going to be having some conversation. That was the point of it in a professional setting is to build relationships and make connections with people. And, you know, we use the meal as sort of a vehicle, um, you know, for those professional settings, um, you know, to, to, so eating, right, or, you know, at a reception, eating, drinking, that type of thing is all kind of part of that cultural, you know, way that we connect with others. Um, and so conversation is important. Um, we want to steer clear of controversial topics. So controversial social issues, religion, politics, uh, sometimes I would even joke, even sports, right? If someone's particularly passionate about it, um, you wanna make sure that again, it's positive, right? Positive. They say it's called small talk for a reason. It should be about small things, lighthearted things, positive things. Um, when, you know, debates is, is wonderful when you know someone very, very well. And even debates when you know someone well can cause kind of ruffled feathers, right? Um, and so we just want to be cautious about that. We're trying to build positive relationships, especially when we don't know someone very well. So small talk. <laughs> um, remember, small, positive, light, you know, lighthearted and, and getting to know the other person. That's the most important thing. I think I might have a quote on the next screen if I'm remembering correctly. I did talk a little bit more about conversation. I love this quote, it's at the bottom here, but you can make more friends in two months by becoming interested in other people than you can in two years by trying to get other people interested in you. So just going into any situation, networking or a meal or interview, with some questions, right? Even have some repair, like, okay, if a conversation involves what kind of question, you know, might be a good one to throw out there. Um, questions about the other person are always great, you know, or if they're talking about something, asking a follow-up question, right? Or an open-ended question. Those really keep conversation going. They show interest in the other person, um, which is, is important. So some tips, you can let the other person speak first. That's what I was kind of say, you know, show that interest in them. Um, listen, you know, really actively, find something in common and comment on it and build from there. Um, know that silence is not really golden. Um, you don't want too long of awkward pauses. So that's where some preparation of topics or a question you could ask um, comes in handy. And what can you talk about? Well, it might be something current, as long as it's not controversial. Um, you can talk shop at work-related events. So if there's something kind of related to the speaker that was just talking or um, something happening in your career field that could be a, a topic of conversation. I already said to stay positive. And certainly you can exchange business cards, you know, get people's contact information so you can make a good follow-up with them. And then let's talk about, let me make sure I'm staying on time. I am. Okay, we want to talk about ordering um, a little bit here. And what I'd like to do if we can to make this a little bit interactive um, is use this chat feature a bit. So what I usually do here, this is a like a really, you know, kind of nice fancy restaurant just a mile down the street from where I live in Noon Township. It's called the High Hold. It is that special occasion kind of restaurant. And so I pulled some things from their menu in each of these four different courses. So take a look at the menu for just a moment. And basically for any reason that you can think of, right? 
what would you not order and why? And this is gonna help guide us talking about some things about ordering, right? Um, so for whatever reason, something that jumps out at you um, here that you wouldn't order, why wouldn't you order it if you're in kind of that, maybe let's pretend it's an interview or you know a more formal business type of a, of a meal. And, and pretend this is a meal, sorry, that someone else is hosting, right? So they've invited you um, to the meal, like you're the guest in this instance. Francesca said the pan seared Laurel Hill. Uh, Jennifer says the oysters. Okay. Chloe said don't order the most expensive things. Oh, and Francesca about the pan seared Laurel Hill is because it's expensive. Okay. Um, Brianna said the oysters because they're difficult to eat. And yeah. Maggie also said the expensive items. Right, all right, you guys are on the right track. So I like some of the things you're saying here. You can see you chose different things not to order, but the important thing is you're thinking kind of about the why, right? Um, and so, you know, you're hitting some of the important things to keep in mind. Someone mentioned the oysters because they're messy to eat, right? They also have that spinach. Remember I said pesky cooked spinach <laughs> um, in them, but right, they're going to be a little more difficult. So that's something to think about. How hard is this going to be to eat? You know, does it have a, is it messy? Does it have a messy sauce on it, right? Um, you know, barbecue sauce or um, like a, uh, spaghetti sauce or something messy like that. So anything that's messy, uh, definitely avoid. Um, several of you mentioned the most expensive thing on the, on the uh, you know, menu, right? Um, that's something to avoid when you're the guest as well. If the host, however, this is kind of an exception to it, the host would say in this instant, you know, the braised lamb shank, I highly recommend it, right? And you were thinking, wow, that's kind of expensive. But the host then is giving you an idea, like, okay, that's okay to order or something maybe similarly priced, like they're okay with. Um, so that's always good is to kind of follow, you know, sort of the guidance of the host if they give any, um, if they make a recommendation. Um, I know someone else, uh, someone also mentioned difficult to eat. So not just messy, but difficult. Maybe that trout has, uh, you know, you're not sure how the bones might be, right? You know, and that could get a little uh, challenging. Um, even this chicken, I often recommend something that could be eaten easily with a knife and a fork, like a chicken breast is very nice. Um, but in this case, if you read that description, it says smoked chicken leg, right? Any bone in chicken, I'll tell you right now, it's going to be one of the most <laughs> difficult things, like a barbecue chicken very well could have like a bone in it. Fried chicken is going to have like a bone, uh, most likely. So we're going to really think about that. How difficult is it? How expensive is it? All good things. Anything else in the chat, Jen, about things not to order? Um, Chloe mentioned avoid aphrodisiacs in a business setting. Okay. Got it. All good things. I like the way that you guys are, you know, definitely thinking about what to order, what not to order, and why. One thing here is a little less obvious is that, you know, I have multiple courses here on this menu. Um, and generally, this is where you're following your host's lead. It's acceptable to order, you know, at least something that makes up what would be considered like a main course, right? So, you know, that it has like a salad, it maybe has a side and a meat, you know, that type of thing. But beyond that, ordering appetizers or desserts, um, that would be kind of going beyond. If you're the guest, you really don't want to initiate that, right? So follow your host's lead there. So if the host says, you know, you know, when it's dessert and, you know, waiter, wait, uh, wait staff comes around, you know, asks about dessert. If he says, you know, would anyone care for dessert? You're kind of giving that permission. It's your choice to say yes or no in that case, but you wouldn't just, you know, tell the server, um, please bring the dessert menu, right, um, when you're the guest. So it's kind of keeping it to that main course and then only branching out if that's something that's offered, other people are doing, the host is kind of indicating it. Okay? And that's something for you to keep in mind if you're ever the host, right? So say so you are taking someone else out, um, you know, think of these things ahead of time, really, you know, kind of guide it, make recommendations that helps let them know what you're thinking about or offer if you're willing to offer um, those things. Also keep in mind the length of time of the meal. You know, is there really, are you on a time limit? You know, is there really time for appetizers and desserts? The more courses that you get through a meal, the longer the meal is going to take, right? So you have to know kind of the situation too. But all really good things. I would avoid things like um, as much as possible that are more eaten with your hands too. So things that can be eaten with that knife and fork that are more simply prepared are really good choices. You know what, I didn't talk about the dessert course and I'm so sorry about that. We have this dessert silverware, let me cover that here. Um, it moves into your place setting, right? And it's actually set um, so that it moves into it, which is really great. 
Um, but for eating that dessert, just a couple things. The spoon's only going to be used again if it's an ice cream, a sorbet, a pudding, a parfait, you know, a, a layered shortcake, a trifle. Okay, those types of things. Otherwise, there are other desserts, pies, cheesecakes, things like that. Again, cheesecake tonight. It's going to be eaten with the fork. We actually use the fork like a knife, <laughs> um, and so it doesn't need don't need to get out that knife for dessert. Um, a dessert plate's probably going to be a little smaller. It would come like you know like that. You would use the side and handle under the hand and cut that piece of um, food with the side of the fork, cut it down, and then we would you know be able to scoop it times up to our mouth. Okay. Again, if you want more coffee or if you haven't had coffee before, if they didn't offer it before, it might come out with dessert, and that's perfectly you know fine. Um, remember to keep that beverage spoon on the saucer once it's used. Remember everything soiled does not go back on the Preset. So it was just a little something. And if it's preset, our dessert was preset last night. So when they cleared the um, plate, that would be common that it might be preset at like a conference where there's a speaker or something and the servers might not be able to get back around to serve that. And don't eat it from up here, right? And move it into the center of your plate setting if this has been cleared. Now, if there's a speaker and they haven't had a chance to clear your dinner, then you may in fact have to eat it, you know, move it a little closer. You may have to eat it, you know, from, from afar, right? Because they haven't had a chance. Don't move, like some people do this a lot at banquets, you move that dinner plate into the middle of the table. Uh, simply leave it there, you certainly can reach it. Um, if you have to scoot it a little bit closer, that's fine. Okay, so a couple of things about dessert, sorry about that. Back to does all of this really matter, right? We kind of started saying that, you know, this is an important skills to learn. You know, people look for social skills sometimes as important as um, the technical or business skills you're bringing to the table it can make a difference in terms of getting hired, certainly in terms of your career advancement. But it really can help right at Duquesne while you're a student. There's lots of opportunities that you're going to have. Um, and I ran into this, um, she's now an alum, but she was a student, attended one of our etiquette dinners, and then I ran into her later and she gave me this feedback. Um, that she had attended a, a formal networking and a dinner um, event for the National Arthritis Foundation. And she felt because she attended the etiquette dinner, she felt more comfortable and confident um, and wouldn't have been able to get through that event, you know, without having attended this. And so that's exactly what we're going for. It's my hope that like Ad Adriana, um, that you'll be able to apply what you learned and really build that comfortable and confident um, at your next professional event, whether it's a networking event um, or a dining uh, type situation. And was there any other questions at this time? I know we went through a lot of things, um, but we are about at time. And so I wanted to make sure that if there was any final questions that anyone had that you submit that in chat. What is the best way to call a waiter? I can see that um, from here. A very good question. Yeah, we don't want to look like we're hailing a taxi, right? Or be obnoxious about it. And so sometimes we have to wait till the server gets kind of close enough that you can make eye contact. I always recommend just a little, you know, like, excuse me, you know, a little hand signal, but nothing obnoxious, right? Certainly not yelling, um, you know, or if they can come by, if they come by for another reason and you need something, try to get their attention before they walk away. Um, I think that's about, about all that you can do. Hopefully the servers aren't too harried and um, sometimes they are in lots of situations, um, you know, that we're in, they're very busy, um, but hopefully, you know, they'll be looking for that and checking on you regularly. Um, to make sure that you think of things so for the next time that they come by, <laughs> you don't forget. I'm sure we've all been there. I do that all the time. Um, the server comes by, they're asking things and then never fails. As soon as they leave, I think of something, right? That I wanted to ask or need. So just, you know, kind of be thinking of that. So the next time they come by that you ask. We do have another question. Do you have to clear your plate? Say again? Do you have to clear your plate? No, 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 not in not in most more formal dining situations. Servers are going to clear that. Now there could be places where you are having to, you know, maybe you have a think of lots of times when I've had meetings, right, with other colleagues, maybe other people that are members of a professional association or a business, and the restaurant is a little more casual, right? You go into a local place and not as formal and maybe that is the case where you would have to clear it you know like a, a meeting for a business connection at the Starbucks or a Panera let's just use those as an example right it's a little more casual and you are having to clear those right yourself but in most situations where right, a nicer or more formal situation you're not going to be clearing I hope that answered your question oh she means um finish all of the food on your plate oh I'm so sorry okay 
Now I'm with you. Okay. <laughs> that probably makes more sense as a question, right? Um, so the answer is no, right? So it's, it's, it's seeking a balance, right? Um, you do need to eat, even if you're nervous, even if it's an interview, right? You need to participate in the meal. So you have to eat enough that it's like you're participating, but you don't, it's not like a clean plate club, you know? We don't have to eat like it's your last meal, right? That you're ever going to have. Um, and so it's fine to leave some, you know, bites of food, but make sure it looks like you didn't leave all of your food, right? So make sure you're at least eating. Um, and then oftentimes the portions honestly are just way too big at most restaurants and, you know, even banquets, there's just so much, it can be difficult to even, you know, begin to um, eat everything. It's certainly understandable. Okay, hey, she said, thank you so much. All right, I'm glad, I'm glad, thanks for clarifying that because I definitely wanted to be able to answer, um, you know, answer the right question. I do want to mention a few um, upcoming um, programs and events that we have going on next week on Tuesday, March, that would be March 9th. We have a networking, Know Your Industry networking event with um, alumni, and that event is for um, what we call MESA, so music, education, sciences, and arts. So if you're in those industries or want to learn a little bit more about working in those fields, we have some really friendly, wonderful alums who are here to help. Um, oh, I did. Okay. So that is happening. You can see that on the screen right there. Um, or maybe you can. Can you see that? Yeah, there we go. Um, so that's next week. Sign up on Handshake. Um, there is the Collegiate Career Fair by West Pass, a wonderful event. 92 employing organizations or graduate schools at that event, Wednesday, March 10th, between 10 and 4. Um, does not mean you have to be there for between 10 or 4. If you have 15 minutes or you have two hours, whatever you have, um, you can make valuable one-on-one -on -one connections with employers by setting up uh, brief sessions with them. You would download the Career Fair Plus app. So it's called Career Fair Plus and look for the West Collegiate Career Fair by Westpac. Download that app. It's where you sign up. It's where you attend the event um, all you know, through, that, um, through that app. And then lastly, our career success CD writing, um, which is Monday, March 15th. So those are a few things we have coming up. Check those out, sign up on Handshake, or in the case of the West Pax Fair through Career Fair Plus. Okay. Okay. So anyway, thank you so much for being with me tonight. I really appreciate your attendance. I hope that you learned a tip or two, or maybe I just reinforced something that you already knew, but just needed a little bit of a reminder um, that you can take into your next event um, and hope to see you at some of our programs again in the future. Thank you, everyone.